definitely found to have um, JAK2 positive essential thrombocytosis. And a really fantastic um, warning point that I took away was that, you know, thrombocytosis, you can initially think of that as a primary problem of the bone marrow. So something like a myeloproliferative process or the other branch point is, is it a secondary or reactive process? And um, Dr. Anand Patel shared a really important pearl that a secondary or reactive process is by far the more common etiology of thrombocytosis. So some things that it can be reactive to are um, infections, even things like iron deficiency anemia, um, inflammation, et cetera. So um, I just found that it was very helpful to really prioritize the reactive or secondary process when you're, um, when you're encountering thrombocytosis. Amazing. Um, I will definitely have to go back and listen to that case later. So we are still looking for a case if anyone is interested in presenting. Um, in the meantime, Jack, do you have any reflections from your two weeks on service that you'd like to share? Oh, gosh. Um, ha, uh... Yeah, you know, I think one of the main reflections that I've had is actually just like how, like, I think sometimes, um, um, like, we all come to morning reports in VMR to like learn clinical reasoning. And I think sometimes there's this sense that like cases um, or that like the case discussion that we have here, sometimes, sometimes I've, I've heard people say like, well, like morning report isn't like, you know, the, the real day-to-day -day practice in medicine. And I would say I was like, um, uh, there was there was a number of times where I was like, there are things that I've learned about the reasoning process or about or about clinical scenarios or about diagnoses from the VMR community that like were really informative of patient care decisions that that we made day to day. We had a case on our service of somebody who had amiodarone induced lung toxicity, and like Charmaine and I were lucky enough to to discuss a case of that just a few weeks ago. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm so primed for knowing elements of this particular diagnosis um, uh, from coming to VMR. And like that came up time and time and time again, whether it was schemas, illness script recognition or reasoning pearls, like the law of proportionality or like, or other important concepts, like where, where the center of gravity is in a case. And so I think I was just super stoked like every day to be like, wow, like this group of this like group of people who I get to come and learn with and from so often, it's like directly informing day-to-day -day practice. And I think one of the other things that was special is like I'm here in San Francisco taking things that I've learned from people across the world to like apply to patient care here. Um, and it just really made me feel um, just grateful and humbled by um, how much teaching and learning happens in this space, like essentially 365 days a year. Um, and so I think there was, yeah, just that sort of consistent feeling of just gratitude and warmth for um, what a special place this is and what a special community this is. Thanks to everyone here. Amazing. There is nothing more kind of satisfying and rewarding when kind of a principle you have learned through deliberate practice comes into play in a real life scenario and being able to apply that to maybe a scenario I hadn't seen in real life before. Um, so we are in for a real treat. Yeah because Dr. Berger huh? has volunteered to present it's a case. Um, so we are very excited about that. Um, and just wanted to remind if you are unmuted, just to please uh, mute yourself unless you're sharing your thoughts. Um, so Dr. Berger, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, can you guys hear me? Excellent. Hey, everyone. I'm Rebecca Berger. I'm a um, attending hospitalist at Weill Cornell in New York City. Um, have been a VMR lurker for many months now and uh, try to participate when I can. Well, thank you so much for presenting a case. Um, I always learn so much from them, so I'm so excited. Um, without further ado, Madalena, would you pull up the whiteboard and we can let the learning begin? Great, I will do that now. <laughs> 
And also, everybody, please do feel free to share your thoughts in the chat as the case un, uh, as the case unfolds. Anne Marie and I will um, uh, will also like work to bring in as many voices as possible into the discussion, um, uh, just to make sure that um, we embody um, uh, what what I what I think we hope to convey, which is that clinical reasoning is very much a team sport. So we all get to be one one big team together in uh, hoping to solve Dr. Berger's case. Okay, so um, the chief complaint is, uh, I'll, I'll give you a 26-year-old woman with uh, several weeks of cough, fevers, and shortness of breath. Do you want more to start, or do you want to just start from there, whatever you guys want? Um, I, we can maybe take a little, um, a, a little quick review of this, if that sounds okay, Anne-Marie. Um, you know, I would say, you know, I think, um, 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 you know, the, the clinical syndrome of cough, fever, and shortness of breath is one that is, that is, that is not going to be unfamiliar to many of the members of the CP solvers community. And I think really sort of how, how I usually think about this is sort of like, what, what is, what is the dominant chief concern? And then what are, what are going to be sort of the, or what is the company that that chief concern keeps? And I think in this case, we have dyspnea as, as the dominant chief concern, and dyspnea is coming with its two close friends of cough and fever. I think, you know, um, uh, uh, one, of, one, of, one of the first things that, that, that Robbie shared with me after discussing a clinical case was when you have two symptoms um, uh, that, that oftentimes come together, focus on the more, the more concerning one. So if you have headache and altered mental status, focus on the altered mental status. In this case, we have cough and shortness of breath, and we're going to focus on the shortness of breath, sort of using our general dyspnea pyramid approach, right? Is it, is it related to the lungs? Is it related to the heart? Is it related to a blood vessel problem, whether that's anemia or, or a pulmonary embolism? Or is it related to something else such as anxiety or, um, uh, uh, or in the rare case, a neuromuscular problem? And I think if we look at the company that the dyspnea is keeping in this case, which is fever, the probability of this being a pulmonary process is going to go up um, uh, is, uh, yeah, I would say it's going to go up, whether that's because um, there is a pulmonary infection happening um, uh, uh, or whether, whether it's because there is, there is another um, uh, uh, systemic inflammatory process affecting the pulmonary parenchyma, for example, a connective tissue disease or an, auto, uh, or an autoimmune disease. But in reality, that's about as far as I feel like we can take it. It's quite hard to sift through shortness of breath with just the history alone. But oftentimes, um, um, uh, uh, where, I, where, where I feel like we can make the most, most process or most progress is, is there, is there inflammation? And that may prioritize the lungs. Whereas if there's a syndrome of volume overload, that may prioritize the heart. But we have to be open to the reality that any of those organs that we listed, heart, lungs, blood vessels, everything else, all of them may come with a clinical syndrome of systemic inflammation. And so without the exam or imaging, I struggle to take it super far, but I'm curious, Anne-Marie, if there's anything else that you would feel like you would be focusing on at this point in the case. I think in this case, there's the fast thinking and then the slower thinking. So the first thing I hear when I hear this scenario, as Jack has alluded to, is it sounds like a COVID-like syndrome. And so that, you know, is the first thing that's going to cross my mind, and it makes sense to consider doing that evaluation, but you don't want to anchor so much that you miss other things. And so, you know, really asking about exposures, thinking about, you know, do we know the immune status? Do we know exposures? And is there anything that, like, makes us really worried about some other etiology at play here? So it's definitely a case where it's like I have the fast thinking and then I have to make myself slow down um, as Jack did and like really think through the clinical scenario so I don't miss anything. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so I'll give you the rest of the HPI just to round it out. So again, as I mentioned, she was feeling well until about three weeks ago, um, at which point she developed a worsening of a chronic cough, which I'll tell you more about. Um, as well as intermittent fevers up to about 101 Fahrenheit um, and progressive dyspnea. Um, and then uh, over the two days prior to coming in, she also had some bilateral lower extremity kind of muscle cramping. Um, and that was actually the symptom that prompted her to go to an urgent care. Um, and there she was found to be very tachycardic up to the 130s and was sent to the ED. 
Um, and I'll just fill in a little bit more about that chronic cough history. So about four years ago, she was diagnosed with asthma um, when she developed a cough with exercise. Um, she has a chronic cough that's worse at night. Um, takes budesonide inhalers daily and montelukast daily, which have overall improved her symptoms, although not fully resolved. She has no other past medical history. So her medications, as I mentioned, are just the, uh, it's actually a Simbicort, sorry, budesonide, budesonide for matter of all, inhaler as well as a montelukast daily. Um, has no known allergies, no known significant family history. Um, and in terms of her... Uh, social history, she is originally from China, um, moved here in high school, so that would have been probably 10 years ago. Um, uh, she's uh, both a student and works in finance. She lives here in New York City. Her last travel back to China was about three years ago. Um, no smoking of tobacco or marijuana or any other substances, no um, illicit drug use and uh, kind of minimal social alcohol use. I'll stop there. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Berger. Maybe, um, maybe I'll um, uh, tackle a little bit of what came up in sort of the remainder of the, of the HPI and then turn it over to you, Anne-Marie, for some of this background info. Um, I think, you know, the, it seems like the predominant sort of, sort of new symptoms that we got from the rest of the HPI was the fact that there's also this associated um, associated bilateral lower extremity muscle cramping, and then I think we sort of got 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 more information about the sort of general tempo of this of this illness and sort of a better characterization of the shortness of breath. I think the first question is sort of how how can we start to integrate the finding of bilateral lower extremity muscle cramping into our um, original chief concern of shortness of breath and fever, and I think one place that my mind goes is how can we how can we start to think about lung plus muscle syndromes? And I think that there's a few ways in which we can get that. Many of the things that cause, for example, an, an acute pulmonary infection or even a subacute pulmonary infection can also present with a clinical syndrome of myalgias. We've seen that time and time again, whether it's with COVID, whether it's with influenza, right? More commonly, it's going to be viral infections. And then also there are some bacterial infections that that can also have um, uh, um, myalgias accompanying with it. I think that there was recently a case in um, from SHM that, uh, or from the Journal of Hospital Medicine that looked at how Legionella was causing a clinical syndrome of myositis in addition to pulmonary complaints. Mycoplasma is another organism that can cause pneumonia as well as, um, uh, as, well as musculoskeletal conditions. But I think we also, given the fact that this has been happening over a few weeks, have to also consider the non-infectious inflammatory syndromes. And if we wanna draw a line between um, uh, a young person, subacute inflammation, lung, and potentially muscle complaints, um, there are connective tissue diseases that can do it, whether it's something like lupus or other connective tissue diseases like dermatomyositis or polymyositis. She's maybe not the right demographic for those, for those latter two, but certainly as we move further and further in terms of the time course of an inflammatory illness, we move further and further away from our typical pyogenic bacterial or viral infections and potentially start to consider autoimmune diseases. And then the other thing that I would say is, you know, if we think about muscles that are involved in, in shortness of breath, there is that big, large muscle in the center of our chest, which is the heart muscle. And so if there is a, um, a systemic myositis affecting the muscles of her lower extremities, we also have to be open to the fact that maybe we're dealing with a myocarditis, which can certainly come from many of, of the viruses we've already mentioned, whether that's COVID, influenza, or some of the more characteristic um, some of the more characteristic um, uh, myocardial viruses like Coxsackie, for example. So I would say like what, what, what that information does is sort of open up the specter of, of um, systemic connective tissue disease, opens up the specter of, of um, maybe refining some of the microbes we're thinking about for pulmonary infections, and then also brings the heart muscle into play if we're thinking about other muscles that are going to be involved. And then I'm curious, Anne-Marie, how you're thinking about some of the background that we have here. Sorry, um, forgot to unmute. Whenever I hear about something like asthma, that's a very common condition, I try to go back and get more information about how it was diagnosed um, because sometimes it is 
something that gets kind of put into the chart or maybe there's a consideration of this, um, but there's not objective data to back it up. Um, and sometimes there's a lot of data to back it up. So I would want to go back and ask about the symptoms. It sounds like a lot of them were cough, um, but you know, other symptoms that were at play, response to treatment, um, get more history, you know, if there was ever hospitalizations, um, everything like that. And then also review if there's things like spirometry um, to see if they did a bronchodilator challenge and if there was appropriate response to the bronchodilator and if there were signs of obstruction or restriction on the spirometry, if there was any past imaging of the chest in the past. Um, and so just really try to get more data and say like, is this asthma or is this maybe something else that was diagnosed as asthma because asthma is a very common condition or is it asthma, but maybe there's a complication of asthma like an asthma plus syndrome. Um, so I think about ABPA. Um, so you can ask about sputum production as the brown sputum production infiltrates on chest x-ray. Look at some of the um, laboratory data like eosinophilia, elevated IgE levels. And then also be thinking um, about aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. So trying to get a good history of there are certain triggers, um, asking about allergic triggers, you know, seeing if I can find something that triggers the symptoms, thinking about a hypersensitivity syndrome. So really getting exposures about that. And I think that that's I think understanding background better is really going to help inform the foreground here. And I'd say in a young patient, I'm also thinking about congenital um, things that could be at play. One thing that could masquerade is something like cystic fibrosis. Um, I think about it less commonly um, in this situation than um, you know others just due to demographic factors, but also primary ciliary dyskinesia or other conditions that maybe could be present, but manifest in a longer way or even um, certain immunodeficiencies. Um, so I could, would be asking about sinus infection, ear infections, things like that to help better inform what's going on. I'd also want a complete vaccination history um, and then also thinking about other exposures such as tuberculosis, things like that that could be latent and manifest at a later time. Um, it doesn't sound like there's like vaping or tobacco or other inhaled substances. So that would just be kind of how I would be a, trying to figure out the background to help inform the foreground. Okay, so um, I'll just give you a couple more things quickly on the review of systems and then I can share her exam. Um, a few people in the chat are asking about other um, kind of exposures and review systems, which is great. So um, uh, the question came up, does she live on a farm or was she exposed to animal products? Um, no, she lives here in New York City, which is pretty far from most farms. Um, has not had any recent exposure to farm animals. Um, she does uh, in addition to the um, travel to China three years ago, as I mentioned, um, she did travel to California two or three months ago, um, but was in, not in any kind of unique environment with any exposures that she could identify. Um, no sick contacts, no new medications, no other changes to her um, kind of exposures. Otherwise, no um, rashes or joint pain. Um, so her exam... Uh, at the time um, she came into the ED, she was a febrile 37.2 Celsius. Um, her heart rate initially was, sorry, 138. Uh, blood pressure was 133 over 85. Respiratory rate um, was 18. And her um, O2 saturation was 92% on room air, improved to 98% on two liters. Um, so, in terms of her exam, otherwise, um, young woman, overall well-appearing, sitting up, no acute respiratory distress. Um, her oropharynx is clear with no exudate or erythema. Um, her heart was uh, tachycardic, but regular with no murmurs or other abnormal 
heart sounds. Hold on, I don't believe this person's pulmonary exam was correct, so I'm pulling out mine. Uh, she had a sorry focal focal wheeze uh, and some crackles in her left mid and upper lung fields. Uh, the left base and the right lung were pretty clear throughout. Um, her abdomen was soft and on tender. Um, her extremities, uh, I will tell you, there was no evidence of hitting edema on exam. The patient endorsed that her legs just felt a little bit kind of larger or more swollen than normal, but there was no no pitting edema that, that I could uh, appreciate, and her neurologic exam was unremarkable. She was awake and oriented and moving all of her extremities. And I apologize to the neuro people in the room. I didn't do much more than that. Let's just start out looking at the vital signs. One of the first things I you know, check myself is, is sick or not sick. And when a young patient has tachycardia to that degree, I'm really concerned um, about them because the body has a lot of physiologic reserve and if the heart's having to beat that fast, I'm worried that they're under a great amount of stress. And, you know, also even to get hypoxemia as a young person, it takes a lot more. So even you know, being on two liters, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about their status right now. And so I'd want to be, you know, making quick decisions, making sure I'm stabilizing them. Thankfully, it sounds like they're not an extremis um, right now. And so we have a little bit of time, but I definitely want to be aggressive um, about working them up. Um, Jack, what thoughts do you have about the exam? Well, I think, um, I think your analysis in terms of the severity of illness is, is, um, is, spot on it and you know I think we're at, uh, it is it is it is always humbling to see the degree to which a young um, uh, uh, very healthy person can compensate um, uh, before things start to start to potentially get worse very quickly and so I completely agree with you in terms of this the speed at which we need to at least be be coming to some answers here because you know when we see tachycardia to, to this degree and even a mild bit of hypoxemia and somebody who is otherwise quite robust, um, uh, the potential for things to start to get worse certainly comes up. In terms of the exam, you know, I would say I am, uh, I am having a hard time making a ton of progress on, uh, on this exam from where you took us after the background medical history. But I think what, what it does tell us is it probably helps us to refine some of the hypotheses that we had, right? We initially were, you know, exploring, is there some component of a pulmonary parenchymal process contributing to her shortness of breath? And we have some, 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 some answer to that with the pulmonary exam findings. I think one of the questions that I was asking is, you know, what parts of the exam can be attributable to the background and what parts can be attributable to the foreground? In somebody who we know has asthma, it's not uncommon to see an exacerbation of wheezing in any sort of acute pulmonary illness, but the crackles that we have in the mid and the upper lung fields um, um, uh, sort of is probably something new related to whatever is bringing, um, uh, is bringing her into the hospital and whether those crackles are related to a, uh, to a infectious process, right? So is it, is it, is it pus? Is it blood? Is it water? Or is it, is it inflammatory cells? I think we'll hopefully be able to get some more, some more answers to those questions based off of imaging. But if we're just going to go to base, to base rate alone, systemic inflammation plus new pulmonary parenchymal findings equals the syndrome of pneumonia. And then I think what our job is going to be to do is, is one, confirm or falsify the pneumonia hypothesis. And if we confirm the pneumonia hypothesis, explore the microbes because the tempo is a little bit off for what we would expect to see from a general run of the mill community acquired pneumonia. If we end up falsifying the pneumonia hypothesis, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what else could this be if it's not an acute lung infection? And I think in this case, I'm sort of looking to a couple of the other exam findings to sort of evaluate for, it, for a potential non-infectious cause. I think one hypothesis that we talked about is the heart, like is the heart on the hook for the lung findings? And that would usually be from, from cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but we don't have some of the classic findings that we would expect to see for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. We don't see jugular venous pulse elevation, and we have unilateral rather than bilateral crackles. There are some scenarios in which an acute heart problem can give us unilateral lung unilateral lung findings, like an acute valvular 
abnormality. For example, acute MR can sometimes give us asymmetric pulmonary edema. But in this case, we have no real signature, at least in the information that Dr. Berger has given us, that this is somebody who is at risk for an endocardial process or a new valvulopathy. Um, uh, and so in that case, like that hypothesis, while present in my mind, is sort of going backwards until we have really excluded the acute pulmonary infection or the subacute pulmonary infection, of which you mentioned, mentioned one possible culprit, Anne-Marie, which would be TB, and then other ones that we can think about for a more subacute indolent pulmonary infection would be some of the endemic fungal infections. And I saw Hans very astutely mention in the chat that this is somebody who may have been exposed to COXI during their recent travels to California. But I also think Lauren's question in the chat is also super important, which is like, is there again, are we, um, uh, uh, is there other evidence we could collect to sort of um, uh, confirm or falsify the cardiac induced pulmonary disease um, uh, hypothesis here. So I think that's where my brain is going right now is like, is the imaging going to support pneumonia or is it going to support something else? The other things that it could be could be from the heart or it could be from a non-infectious inflammatory process. Um, but I think time will only tell um, uh, in, uh, in terms of those things. So yeah, I'm very curious to see. As I'm thinking about management, um, you know, even though there is some lung findings, I think I'd be hard pressed not to pursue evaluation for a PE, you know, thinking as things, sometimes things can be related, such as having COVID pneumonia and a PE or other inflammatory states can kind of precipitate this. Um, what kind of other evaluation um, would you be thinking about getting up front? Uh, I'm with you. I am an enormous fan of cross-sectional imaging of the chest. Um, and so I think that that, that that is super helpful here. You know, I think the other things is, you know, we have probably enough of a clinical syndrome um, of systemic infection to be thinking about, you know, blood cultures, potentially sputum cultures. They're not, um, uh, uh, they, are, they are very helpful when they are helpful, but oftentimes are not super helpful for the, for the regular sputum culture, but I think that would be a helpful place to go. But really, I think the pattern that we see on the chest imaging is going to, is going to help guide us. If we see consolidations, that's going to send us one way. If we see ground glass opacities, that may send us in a slightly different direction. And if we see a PE, like you mentioned, that's going to take us into potentially a, and potentially another space as well. Um, so I feel like we're really sort of in like the basic labs, cross-sectional imaging, and then maybe sort of a general infectious workup. But a, um, acknowledging that if those sort of um, uh, more probabilistic hypotheses don't play out, then we may go into a more either broader infectious workup or move away from the infectious workup altogether. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I'm actually going to flip the normal order. I'm going to show you her chest imaging first, um, give you guys a chance to comment on it, and then um, I can show you her lab. So, I can actually pull up if I'm allowed to share. So I'll show you her chest x-ray first. And I have a very slow computer today, one second. As this is, um, uh, as your point, so I just want to give a shout out to Lawrence, to Lauren's comment in the chat of like sort of also as we're pursuing these things, I think it's important um, I certainly overlook the value of a POCUS here and getting sort of some sense of do we see, do we see evidence of elevated venous pressures like a plump IVC that might put the heart on the hook more? Can we get some look at how the cardiac squeeze look? And so Lauren, I think that's a brilliant point to bring in here of like something that we can get an answer to fairly quickly that may shift us, or that may shift us dramatically in the way that we're thinking about the case. So thank you for that plug. Agree. Can someone let me screen share? Should be good now, I think, with the co-host response. Perfect. Can you guys see an x-ray? Can you guys see an x-ray? Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, excellent. Her chest x-ray was read as, sorry, give me one moment. Uh, left apical and upper lung, airspace opacity, uh, with a few coarse linear opacities in the right middle and lower lobe. But this was the dominant finding here in the left upper. And then I'll show you her CT. Uh, 
comment on some hyperinflation? Because um, it That's looks a, a little question. hyperinflated to me. The radiologist did not comment on hyperinflation. Let me just pull it up one more time. Um, one thing I like to look for when I'm looking for hyperinflation is, you know, the way the diaphragms look and whether they're, um, and, you know, I see the diaphragms as being kind of nice and round. And I think, Emory, it may be that we're so accustomed to looking at old people's lungs with poor volumes that these actually look big, but this is probably the normal number of ribs that you would expect to see, right? And the diaphragms don't look too flat to me. Um, so the way y'all just didn't comment on it, I didn't really appreciate it much either. And were there, were there any comments, this, um, um, uh, this, I have, don't, don't have the best eyesight uh, at baseline and particularly stare, trying to get up close to a screen. Did they comment anything about like cystic looking spaces or cavities in the right or in the left upper lobe there? Or is that just me um, creating something out of nothing? I see what you're saying. Are you, are you, um, yeah, yeah. Kind of looking here. They did not. Um, and I saw that as well. It's kind of interesting. Cause when you look on this side, I think it may be the contour of the ribs. See how they're, they're almost is kind of a matching thing over here. Um, and so they did not comment on it. And I'll give you guys a CT so that you can believe me, but, um, no, I but yeah, I see what you're saying here. There's a, there's kind of a suspicion for something that looks cavitary, but, um, I think that's just some rib contour overlying the, the opacity. Right on. I believe you even without the CT. Thank you. <laughs> and then I will show you guys her CT. Can you guys see a video here? Excellent. Okay, I'll run this for you. Since we're going through, you guys can see this pretty extensive left upper lobe opacification. Little bit of ground glass there on the right as we pass through, but primarily left upper, and I think a little bit of middle lobe. And as we go down into the bases, the bases are pretty clear. So predominantly that left upper lobe and apical finding. Um, and I can read you guys the official report. Um, I didn't show you these windows, but there was no evidence of pulmonary embolism. They did do it with a PE protocol. Um, predominantly peripheral, large left upper lobe consolidation and smaller consolidation in the superior segment of the left lower lobe. And then a few um, small right upper lobe ground glass opacities, patent airways. They did comment on a trace left pleural effusion, which I didn't comment on, but very tiny trace left pleural effusion here. Um, and then some lymphadenopathy um, in the left superhylar and left hyalur region, up to 1.3 centimeters all on the left, nothing on the right. Cardiac chambers looked normal. Um, I can share some initial thoughts and hopefully uh, Jack will have some more thoughts. I think whenever you hear something in the upper lobes of the lungs, you have to be thinking about tuberculosis, um, especially reactivated tuberculosis likes to hang out in areas where there's more oxygen. Um, and so often you'll see it in the upper lobes of the lungs, um, whereas pulmonary edema tends to be gravity dependent. So we'll be seen more in the lower parts of the lungs. Um, so definitely I'm still thinking about, could this be tuberculosis um, with the lymphadenopathy? Um, there are certainly other etiologies like fungal etiologies. Whenever you say TB, you should also be thinking, um, could this be um, histoplasmosis? And then with a travel to California, could this be um, coccidio? Um, mycosis or kind of other etiologies too. I'm going to be thinking more about things that are more indolent and slowly progressive um, just due to the time course, although certainly you could have an acute on chronic um, process here um, that would be, you know, like presenting as something more acutely. So I'll let um, Jack share some additional thoughts. No, I think um, I completely agree with your differential there that, that, that you added in terms of thinking about, about you know, common pyogenic bacterial infections, it's maybe a little bit long for that to be the case. Um, certainly the more indolent ones like 
mycobacterial disease and fungal disease. And then I also think, you know, you, um, uh, uh, you brought in, I think, really important diagnoses to think about sp specifically in somebody with known asthma and thinking about some of the, the sort of um, uh, uh, complications of long of long standing asthma. If we're going to bring fungal into the fold of something like ABPA, um, uh, oftentimes I um, uh, I feel like it is it is at least considered in somebody who has like recurrent and severe exacerbations of underlying asthma. And it sounds like this may not be um, that 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 phenotype for this um, uh, for this patient in terms of the general severity of um, uh, of her disease, but. ABPA can certainly also have a, um, a potential upper lobe predominance. And so I think that's an, an important one that, that you brought up, that you brought, brought into the fold earlier that I think certainly warrants, warrants a space back in the fold now. And I think really like the dominance of our cognitive energy has to focus on these infectious pathogens first. If that workup becomes unrevealing, then we can potentially look into the non, into the non-infectious um, uh, pulmonary findings, whether that's an organizing pneumonia type picture related to a previously exposed infection or an, uh, an uh, potential in, uh, um, in environmental pathogen, or like um, it would be terrible if this, if this was the case, but if it does end up going in the direction of an underlying pulmonary malignancy. I will say we had sort of talked about the, the possibility of, um, we had talked about the possibility of like systemic autoimmune disease and connective tissue disease. And I don't usually think about those characteristically presenting with focal pulmonary consolidations. Rheumatoid arthritis is maybe one that can do that, but in the absence of joint findings that are characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis, that, that sort of probability of disease goes down. And then the other common autoimmune diseases like the connective tissue diseases like lupus are usually gonna present with more of a serositis and plural and, and plural disease rather than pulmonary parenchymal disease of, of, of consolidations. And so I think exactly where you're at, Anne-Marie, in terms of focusing on the infectious workup of TB in somebody who has known risk factors and exposure to an area where it's, where it's endemic, the other endemic fungal infections. And then certainly if we see laboratory evidence of, for example, of, of, um, of peripheral eosinophilia, then maybe also ABPA gets a little bit more stronger of a case as well in this young, in, in this young woman who has asthma. But, um, you know, I think in terms of where to go from there, I feel like we, she probably deserves a treatment course for community acquired pneumonia as we try to figure out other things um, um, uh, where we go. Although again, the sort of weight of the tempo is maybe moving us away from those classic pyogenic organisms. We have to sort of think probabilistically and sort of exclude those before we maybe center on some of the other alternative diagnoses here. But I'm really curious to learn from Dr. Berger where, um, uh, where sort of this case unfolded and how both, um, both she and the team who is taking, um, who is taking care of this patient um, thought about this case. And then we'll turn it back to you, Anne-Marie, if you have any other thoughts before we move on. And it's definitely a case where I would um, discuss with a patient sending an HIV test just to make sure that I've kind of evaluated for that as well. Because if that were positive, that would open up a lot of more diagnostic possibilities. Awesome, thanks guys. I'll give you the last next. Um, so her white blood cell count was 24,000. Um, hemoglobin was 13, platelet was 348. Uh, the differential on her white blood cell count was 28% neutrophils, 13% lymphocytes, and 57% eosinophils, with an absolute eosinophil count of 13,690. Uh, her chemistry, her basic metabolic panel was completely normal. I saved the numbers. Uh, her LFTs were notable only for mildly elevated transaminases with an ALT of 47, ALT of 55, but with normal Billy's Alcross and albumin. Uh, she had a D-dimer of 1205, which is maybe less relevant now that we already have her CT. Uh, what else? She had a procalcitonin that was undetectable. Uh, and that was kind of the initial basic set of labs that were sent. Okay, so it looks like we have some funky inflammation here. So the eosinophilia is definitely going to shift our diagnostic aim because there's only a few things that can cause this degree of eosinophilia. Um, so, you know, when I'm thinking about this degree of eosinophilia, the first thing I'm thinking about are 
infections. Um, those infections are usually parasitic infections um, in the lungs. You can think about things like strongyloides, um, Ascaris, um, some other um, parasitic etiologies, and then also certain fungal infections like um, coccidia mycoses and histo can also be associated with some eosinophilia. And then I'm also thinking about some non-infectious etiologies. Um, one that can be associated with asthma, well, two are ABPA and then um, EGPA as well. Um, so, you know, really getting that good asthma history. Although I will say a lot of times EGPA, it's like asthma that's diagnosed later and becomes like refractory later in life. So I think it's certainly on my differential. I would need some more information um, about it kind of to further kind of differentiate. And then some eosinophilic lung conditions like um, eosinophilic um, pneumonia, things like that. Um, Jack, what other things should I be thinking about here? No, I think your um, I think that approach like, honestly mirrors exactly um, uh, exactly where my where my brain was going, and I think really it's the the degree of eosinophilia here is quite profound. And um, you know, I think we sort of are with 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 counts this high, we're sort of moving into the realm of the hyper eosinophilic syndromes. And I think the secondary causes that you mentioned, whether it's from from underlying infections or other um, um, uh, uh, other non non infectious diseases associated with hyper eosinophilia, like like EGPA, come in come into play. But then also there sort of are the primary hyper hyper eosinophilic symptoms, which could be related to underlying bone marrow problems, whether it's whether it's um, uh, oftentimes a myeloid stem cell disorder, um, um, uh, or it could ultimately end up being idiopathic hyper, e hyper eosinophilic syndrome. I think one of the things that I start to do when we see, when we see eosinophil, eosinophil counts this high and some evidence of potentially end, um, uh, end, organ, uh, end organ involvement in the lungs is start to say, you know, are there signs of hyper, hyper eosinophilic syndrome elsewhere in the body? Are we seeing signs of it on the heart? There is this sort of question of, of, um, of reported leg swelling and certainly eosinophils that high can cause underlying cardiac dysfunction. We can see splinter, splinter hemorrhages on the physical exam because the um, uh, uh, eosinophil counts that high can, um, uh, can lead to sort of clotting and um, uh, uh, embolic foci. Do we see things in the kidneys or God, God forbid, do we see embolic phenomena related to the hypercoagulability of, of eosinophilia in the CNS as well? And so I think sort of both pursuing the workup of the secondary causes, as you mentioned, considering whether or not we need to explore the bone marrow for one of the primary hyper hyper um, hyper eosinophilic syndromes, and then also looking to make sure that we're not seeing other potential end uh, other potential end organ manifestations. And then one of one of the challenging decisions in a scenario like this is if we are seeing end organ manifestations, we know that steroids can wipe away the eosinophil counts very very well. But it can also obscure with some of the diagnostic tests that we may that that we may want to send to ultimately figure out the underlying cause. And so I think that can be a tough management decision of do we start steroids now or do we wait to get some of the diagnostics before we start um, uh, before we start steroids? And certainly we're also going to have to exclude some of the underlying infections that can drive hyper hyper eosinophilia that you mentioned because um, immunosuppression and, glu and glucocorticoids can make many of those much much worse, particularly. Um, particularly strongyloides, as you mentioned, Anne Marie. And so I think, um, gosh, like where where to go from here? I think you know, considering bron um, bronchoscopy for the finding of potential of potential e um, uh, eosinophilic pneumonia, I I honestly always forget. I think one of them is associated with peripheral eosinophilia, and one of them is not associated with with peripheral eosinophilia. But I forget whether it's acute or um, uh, um, uh, or chronic. That's is or or is not associated with the peripheral e with the per peripheral EO count. But I think looking um, uh, on the bronchoscopy and then looking into some of some of the other organ systems would potentially be helpful. Um, uh, and then deciding again, like whether or not we're going to empirically treat for something or um, or try to empirically treat the eosinophil count in general to prevent some of the other end organ complications from developing. But that is honestly about as far as I feel like I, I can take it with um, with with what I know so far and uh, anything else would require either leaning on consultants or going to look things up for myself. Uh, 
And one thing I like to remember with EGPA is that positive ANCAs are only found in about 40% of cases. So if you've done a really extensive workup and everything, we might be relying more on tissue findings in the end if that was the primary consideration. Awesome. Uh, I'm, I love where this conversation's going because it's mirroring exactly what I did at the time. Um, so uh, I'll give you guys a couple of other labs quickly. So her uh, COVID swab was negative. Her, um, the rest of her respiratory pathogen panel, which at our hospital includes a number of viruses as well as some atypical bacteria, was all negative. Um, you asked about her potential cardiac involvement with the sacrocardia. She did have a high sensitivity troponin, which was undetectable. She had an EKG, which just showed China sac. Um, she had an echocardiogram, which was essentially normal. Um, and then she also had uh, Dopplers of her lower extremities, given this pain, which had no DVT. Um, and then basically because of the um, findings uh, on the peripheral eosinophilia, um, she actually was taken within a few hours of presentation for bronchoscopy um, by our pulmonary colleagues. Um, and I can just read you the kind of report, which... Oh, this is a long report. Um, basically, the airways looked normal, just a few mu mucoid secretions. They sent off um, specimens uh, from the left upper lobe uh, and performed a transbronchial biopsy, but there was nothing gross. I'm sorry. And um, uh, yeah, sorry, I apologize. Uh, so yeah, they did a transbronchial biopsy. Nothing gross on the on the bronchoscopy um, appearance. The uh, Bronchoscopy had like 45 white blood cells, but unfortunately something happened in process to the lab and they disintegrated on their way to um, the, uh, the differential. So we were not able to get the differential on the, um, on the cells. Uh, other things we had sent off uh, peripherally, including peripheral uh, galactomannan for aspergillus. We looked at the one three beta glucan. Um, we sent off ink as all of those things were sent off on that first hospital day, um, all of which ultimately returned negative, but were still pending at the time of the bronchoscopy. Um, and the last, and uh, sorry, the last um, piece of data will be her lung biopsy, which I can share with you guys after digesting this data. Amazing. Hey, so just to just to cover it, so it sounds like nothing grossly abnormal on the bronchoscopy, no formal differential, but the galactomannan and the beta D glucan was negative. Um, um, were the things like the, um, uh, if there were other helminthic in infections sent off, are those back like strongy or anything, or was sort of the general infectious workup negative? A lot of the things were sent off as serologies. Um, so she, we did send off a strongy antibody IgG, um, which again, hadn't come back, but ultimately was negative. Um, there was nothing on the kind of initial gram stain um, of, the, um, of the specimen, um, but the rest of those infectious studies. What else besides John, you're looking for? Let me see what else I can find. She had her AFB smears were negative. The gram stain was negative with those initial, with that initial BAL specimen. Um, she had a quantifiron, which came back negative. Uh, and the rest of them were kind of cultures that, that took several days. Yeah. Did she have a CK level sent with some of the myalgias that she had? Great question. Yes, it was normal. It was 54. You know, I think um, uh, I will not pretend to be able to take us ultimately into the final diagnosis, but I can sort of share, you know, how, how some of these findings from, from the from the bronchoscopy or at least like weighing in on some of the things that we were thinking about. It seems like what we have primarily is a disorder, a disease characterized by subacute systemic inflammation, profound peripheral eosinophilia, and then focal pulmonary findings. And so I think we started to have, we have sort of started to walk through the um, uh, 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 eosinophilic lung disease category, thinking about, you know, the very classic infections that can do it, whether that's gonna be mycobacterial infections, Helminthic infections rarely, um, rarely viruses do it, and then and then some of the some of the other fungal infections. And I think you know a lot of that diagnostic workup 
has come up unrevealing so far. Um, and so I think then the question is, are there infections that can maybe hide on the sputum cultures or some of the, or some of the serologic testing? And I think, you know, um, uh, there is probably a long list of the, of the types of infections that may be able to hide on those tests. But one that certainly comes to mind is, is, um, uh, is aspergillosis. Oftentimes, um, uh, you know, the galactomannan can have a limited sensitivity from the serum, particularly if, um, uh, particularly if um, uh, there is not underlying disseminated disease. I don't know the test characteristics of it from bronchoscopy or for BAL fluid, but I would at least wonder if the negative galactomannan formally excludes the diagnosis of ABPA or if really the lung biopsy is what we have to rely on. And I think it would certainly be compatible for somebody, again, to have underlying asthma this sort of subacute indolent inflammatory process, profound eosinophilia, to end up ultimately having having ADPA, and I think hopefully we would we would be able to see the aspergillus on on the lung on the lung biopsy. But then, if sort of our our infectious workup from serum, sputum, BAL, and biopsy is negative, then I think I would be like, well, I guess we have to move into some of the non-infectious causes here, which could be things like acute or chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. I think we have to use the cutoff of the ESNFL count from the BAL to formally make that diagnosis. Although I would certainly rely on what the consultant said in this case on how confident they were based off of based off of the biopsy results. And then if we're sort of if if that hypothesis ends up being being negative, I think I'm grappling with like is a underlying eGPA possible here without more of a systemic signature of a vasculitis. Like we don't see purpura, we don't see renal involvement, we don't see nervous system involvement. Um, and so I would be very curious to learn from you, um, from you, um, Anne Marie, kind of how you're weighing the possibility of eGPA here. And then I think if, the, if we end up closing the book on that hypothesis, then we're potentially dealing with the primary hyper eosinophilic syndromes or the idiopathic hyper, hyper eosinophilic syndromes which is a category that I don't know too much about beyond that they just exist. Um, uh, and so, but I think that is sort of how I'm framing it. Of like, we still have to exclude the infections that we can do it, particularly ABPA, if we find that on the biopsy, then that feels compatible. Then we have to exclude the sort of known autoimmune diseases as, uh, uh, um, associated with peripheral eosinophilia, and then ultimately going into that into that HES category. Um, but um, uh, otherwise I feel kind of stumped. And so Anne-Marie, I'm curious how you're, how you're thinking about things now. Yeah, I feel a little stumped too, and this is definitely a case where I'd be relying on experts um, to help me. The good news is we don't have to do any of these cases alone. A lot of times it's a team effort. Um, one of the other things I'd be curious about um, with some of the muscle symptoms, I guess the CK was normal, but the liver enzymes are elevated, so I'd be wondering if an aldolase was sent. I think there's a rare entity called... Um, eosinophilic myalgia syndrome, which I don't know much about, but I would probably be trying to see if there was like any connection that I could get kind of between the two entities. And then, you know, with eGPA, it definitely has less renal manifestations um, than the other forms. But again, it's, I'm not getting a lot of like sinus symptoms or, um, like neurologic symptoms or anything like that. So I, I feel a little hard pressed too, um, to kind of think about eGPA, but I would definitely be kind of asking rheumatology, hematology um, to weigh in and then um, sending in aspergillus IgE as well and trying to get some more information on that. So I am so excited to hear about the case resolution. Awesome. Um, I love this session again. So in addition to pulmonary seeing her, you know, right when she came in, um, I also had hematology see her for exactly the reasons you guys identified. I think what I was trying to figure out was whether this was a systemic kind of hyper eosinophilic syndrome with end organ involvement at the lung or whether this was a primary pulmonary eosinophilic syndrome, kind of exactly as you guys identified. And the differential beyond that is not something that's kind of in my wheelhouse. Um, so as I mentioned, she went for the bronch uh, in BAL that first day. Um, actually, based on the whole clinical picture, um, pulmonary recommended starting steroids, you know, right after that procedure, even though we didn't have all of the infectious studies back. And I think that was based on just thinking about her demographics and her exposures and, and not feeling like there was necessarily a kind of slam dunk infectious pathogen um, that we were looking for. Uh, so her lung biopsy did come back uh, with no organisms, no fungi, uh, no aspergillus showing uh, acute eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, and I think as Jack suggested, there's kind of this overlap syndrome um, 
between acute and chronic eosinophilia pneumonia. Chronic is the one drug that has um, a higher incidence of peripheral eosinophilia, acute less so. Um, but the time course, she kind of lives right in the middle. Acute is really supposed to be less than four weeks and more commonly presents with a, a more kind of fulminant respiratory failure and more significant hypoxia. Hers actually got better quite quickly um, versus chronic, which tends to be three to four months of symptoms. So again, she kind of lived somewhere in between. Um, you know, and part of why I said I think at the beginning that there are some loose ends that I haven't tied up is, is we still didn't really identify the kind of myalgias, uh, the transaminases. It has not been clear to me exactly what those are from um, besides, you know, blaming kind of systemic inflammation. Um, a lot of her advanced hematology workup is still pending. This case is just from last week. So we had peripheral flow cytometry, which actually just came back today, that shows predominantly just a clonal T-cell population, but with some suggestion of a possible mild uh, uh, monoclonal population that she's going to be seeing beam for. So I think, you know, the, the kind of only diagnosis we have right now is the acute eosinophilic pneumonia, but I think it remains to me unclear whether she could have some underlying hyper eosinophilic process primary um, that that could have been driving this this process as well. One very interesting thing is we actually went back on her patient portal from her primary care doctor from the last three years and found that she has had eosinophilia up to about 25% um, with uh, acute with um, absolute counts in the kind of low thousands range for a couple of years. Um, had never previously been kind of worked up or referred. I think I presume it was it was her asthma and her kind of atopic um, history was blamed, um, but. That kind of, again, brings up the question of how acute this process was and whether she has some underlying primary hyper syndrome that kind of flared in this setting. Amazing. Um, this is an, an incredible case, one that I'm sure um, we could reflect on for at least another hour. I want to be mindful of everyone's time um, uh, and just give you a huge shout out, Dr. Berger, for presenting this phenomenal case today. I also want, want to give a shout out to just like some absolutely phenomenal reasoning coming in coming in through the chat. A particular shout out to Rodriguez, who um, uh, gave us a phenomenal problem representation very, very early on in the case. That act, that has that has held up brilliantly um, uh, uh, throughout the ways in which the discussion has has um, has unfolded, and I think everything from the cardiac hypothesis to the POCUS findings to the chest X-ray interpretations that that came through, like there was if this was absolutely on fire. Yes, absolutely amazing. And um, there might be a um, comment in the chat um, from our case presenter, Rebecca, that she would want to stop coming to VMR unless we called her by her first name. So thank you so much for an absolutely amazing case. And I'm always so humbled. Um, I learned so much just hearing um, Jack and then the chat talk through the case. And then, um, yeah, it's just absolutely amazing. So uh, Valet, uh, I was looking at your teaching points and they look phenomenal. And I'm also very impressed with the little um, emojis on them as well. So I am so excited to hear uh, your case recap. Yeah, thank you. This was an amazing discussion. I, the emojis are just to fill <laughs> the space because I was overwhelmed with um, all the books that you shared today. And thank you, Rebecca, for this case. I was reading it for it to be an ID diagnosis, but still it was amazing. So we started with a dyspnea um, chief concern. And so to remember the dyspnea pyramid, we start with lungs at the base, then to heart, and then to others, such as musculoskeletal, hematologic uh, conditions, uh, and well, others. Um, but I remember a pro that Jack also shared, but Ravi shared uh, some BMRs ago about the tri triage, triage questions when someone presents with shortness of breath. And that includes if the patient presents with fever, in which case we should prioritize lungs instead of heart, uh, but also thinking about uh, the itis that could affect the heart and also the vessels. And then if there are signs of volume overload that were not in this patient, uh, we should prioritize the heart instead of the lungs. And also, uh, Jack gave us a great overview of the coexistence of myalgias with uh, shortness of breath and thinking if this could be part of a systemic viral syndrome or myocarditis that could also affect with the heart muscle or an electrolyte imbalance. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, that was my puppy. <laughs>
And um, then we were thinking, okay, so what are the points in favor or against the heart or the lungs? And then we didn't really have a lot of um, facts pro heart, but the, um, yes, pro lungs. And so the fact that it was uh, unilateral crackles in the exam, the past medical history, and also the finding of low saturation and lack of signs that would favor volume overload or a uh, heart failure type syndrome. And then, um, as Jack pointed out, the time course was not fitting for something more common like a, a, a community acquired pneumonia, but in the category of subacute pulmonary inflammation, we could um, divide it in infectious etiologies and non-infectious etiologies. The infectious etiologies uh, um, include TB, nocardia, endemic mycosis, given also the recent travel, aspergillus, um, and the ones that favor the upper lobe, which was the finding uh, on the chest X-ray are TB and aspergillus uh, predominantly. And then the non-infectious category could include avasclitis, and well, in this case, the eosinophilic pneumonia that was the diagnosis, sarcoidosis, and other autoimmune diseases. And then, well, I wanted to share this pearl that I, 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 I learned about the diagnosis of hyper um, the infectious diseases that could cause it, and it's a, a pneumonia called fiesta, which means party in Spanish. And so that includes fasciola and also other traumatos like paragonimus and schistosoma, uh, isospora, which has a new name, it's called cystoisospora, and echinococcus, which is found in dogs, uh, strongyloides, which was, which was uh, mentioned in this discussion a lot, toxocar and also ascaris. So thank you so much for this case, it was amazing. I'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>